Are you ready? Hey, everybody. Hey, folks. Hello, everybody. People in the back. Welcome, everybody. Welcome to the inner loop. Welcome, everybody. Welcome to the inner loop. Without further ado. Without further ado. Okay, so without further ado, we're going to get started. We should get started. We're yeah. Rolling. I'm right there. We're, we're, we're going to get started. <laughs> Welcome to the Interloop Radio. I'm Courtney Sexton. And I'm Rachel Coots. Thank you for joining us. If you haven't already, remember to subscribe to our podcast, leave us a review, and check out our website at theinterlooplit.org. For any new listeners out there, here on the Interloop Radio, we delve into the, all things creative writing, whether that be inspiration or craft, publishing or editing, how to make a living, or how we all sit down each day in front of a clean blank page our names. Always calling our names. Sometimes we play clips of local writers reading their work at our monthly reading series. Other times we invite those writers as well as other members of the literary community to join our discussion. On today's show, we want to talk about something serious, trauma, writing about trauma, but without all of the trauma. Um, and Rachel, I thought in particular, <laughs> might have some insight here, given your current writing project. <laughs> No, I don't want to be known as the trauma writer. No, no, well, so that's that's a thing, right? That's a joke. Um, yeah, you know, there's lots going on here, and in particular, I was thinking about the difference between trauma and grief, and mm-hmm. both how we process those externally and how we write about them. Right. Um, and a big thing for me that I've been kind of sorting through, and I think that we all sort through at some point as writers, is this idea of Processing on the page, you know, Mm -hmm. in in which you usually produce something that looks like an assignment from your therapist, right? Right. (laughs) Um, And then taking that and building from it something that is actually really beautiful and meaningful and can be experienced by others so that your trauma, in in a sense, becomes others, but in a way that's accessible, Mm -hmm. right? And not overwhelming. Yeah, I would say two things. One is distance. Okay. Get as much distance as you can from the thing that traumatized you. Because the more distance you have, the more perspective you'll have, the more objective you'll be able to be, and you'll be able to present a story to the reader that they can access uh, that doesn't require the experience itself. I so think. your personal experience, you mean? Well, I mean, like, it doesn't require that they sort of have to, I don't know. I guess I would say, like, when you have distance, you can, like, see the many layers of things that are at work. Like, how does this relate to society as a whole? How can other human beings relate to the thing that you went through and why does it matter? Sort of, like, why does it matter outside of your own therapeutic experience you know um which is why the second thing is to keep a journal um and definitely like write it out and let it be therapeutic and let it be wild and let it be you know nonsensical emotional wonderfulness um but keep that bit to yourself and then you can craft it into something that's um consumable by the public yeah, and I mean this. I guess this is to say too. This leads into another question of mine or thought that I've been kind of struggling with. I think that definitely distance in time and distance from the experience helps um, in the creative process. But also, choose how do we choose, right? Like, how do we choose what events, what experiences? Um, That's the magic. <laughs> <laughs> what well, do they kind of choose us, right? Like. I'm a, I'm a firm believer in letting your subconscious do the work. I, like for me, like when you sit down to write, I mean, I'm extremely controlling, don't get me wrong, and like type A. Um, and like would love to know exactly where something's going when I sit down to write it. But all of my best stuff is stuff that I have no idea where I'm going or what I'm writing. And it's the hardest stuff to write because you have to just have faith kind of. And then once you start writing, like your subconscious is going to make all the connections. Like, and it's going to 
create metaphor and it's going to, you know, make symbolism and it's going to take the bits and pieces from where they need to be taken from and like make it into a story, I think. Yeah, I, I agree. I'm always, not always, but in the in the moments when I feel something has been successful, I there is always a point at which I'm surprised by something that I read back to myself. So I'm like, I didn't put that there. I didn't intend for, you know, my dog to be a metaphor for myself, <laughs> um, but it always is. <laughs> also true. Um, <laughs> no, but I guess... Um, Another thing, oh shoot, I just lost my train of thought in one way. Oh, there are these threads, these through lines, right? Um, that circle back. You talked about, you said, you said when we first started this conversation, I don't want to be known as the trauma writer. <laughs> but at some point, there are, there are almost things that are inescapable that are mm. part of our experience that I think um, we shouldn't resist in a way, right? Well, but I. I think- Sorry, go ahead. No, I, I just, I think also there are, those things can present themselves differently. Like when we talk about trauma, it, it's internal, it's external, it's transgenerational, it's mm-hmm. epigenetic, it's, you know, one experience, it's many experiences. Um, and I find too, in a lot of works that I've read where it feels successful or relatable or not just like oh my god this is heavy crying it out everything is horrible um when it gets it it gets at something one of the like mysteries of human existence i think like that's why i'm like so i'm like i wanted to clarify that i i don't want to be known as the trauma writer but i do i wouldn't mind being known as like the transgenerational trauma writer or you know a writer who focuses on like cycles of uh, trauma and abuse and experiences, because to me, that's, what's so interesting about when people write about trauma, like, or about the experience of trauma is that it has these ripple effects that can like, like you said, be written, like can mark your genetic code. Uh, that's how deep it goes. And that can then be carried from generation to generation for like many generations. So something that my great, great grandmother experience could be affecting me now that is crazy fascinating to me because i feel like these cycles of things that happen to the same family over and over again like speaks so much to so many people's experiences and speaks to the human experience on a larger level i like to gesticulate a lot and this microphone is making me <laughs> I'm thinking about um, a few books in particular um, I read, and I think I sent it over to you last summer, Sarah Broom's um, The Yellow House. I know, and I read it right away, and I'm a big fan. Um, And also one that I read a while ago, um, Jeffrey Eugenides' um, Middlesex. And these are all these these same themes, but something that I find in both of those and in others, like about Baldwin or other people who have really, like, done the Mm -hmm. thing here. Yeah. um, there's usually some environmental or ecological or external force mm-hmm. at play that is also causing, um, actually, maybe in these cases, drama that instills trauma, right? Mm-hmm. Um, and there's this kind of emerging larger role or force around the main characters mm. um, that serve as, as a bit of a foil. Um, and I think that's a really... That's a perfect segue <laughs> exactly. <laughs> to our next guest, uh, which we'll get to right after the break. We'll hear from um, a local writer, Megan Alpert, who has successfully navigated writing about trauma without being drama. <laughs> trauma without drama. <laughs> Stay tuned. We've been discussing how trauma presents itself in writing and the writing process. 
Um, and now we'd like to welcome Megan Albert to join us on this journey. Uh, it was a journey for us. I hate when people say that, by the way. Um, <laughs> now you have to own it. <laughs> Megan is a journalist and poet, and she is being featured in our Author's Corner this month um, for her first full and public poem, The Animal at Your Side, which won the Early Prize. And it's available now on the Early Press. Welcome, Megan. Yeah. We are very excited. Such a pleasure to have you. Absolutely. I consumed this book of yours with such verve. <laughs> I can't even think of a word. It just um... with such animal. Yeah. Uh... <laughs> um, it really spoke to me on on many levels. So thank you for birthing it into the world. First of all, um, I know, especially with any book and with one one that covers the ground that this one does, I can't imagine that was easy. Um, and I guess my, my first question to that end is, you know, the speaker here is under a barrage of various traumatic events, death, Grief, displacement, war, diaspora, estrangement, you name it. <laughs> it happens. But it it still is contained well within the pages. It doesn't become overwhelming, which isn't inherently a bad thing. But how do you strike that balance? Um, thanks so much for being <laughs> the box. I'm just gonna lay it there. <laughs> yeah. Um, no, I'm always fascinated to hear people's questions about the book and to hear that people have actually read it carefully is it's so gratifying. So um, thank you for that. And in terms of um, there are a lot of difficult things in the book. And I think that in these poems, ultimately what, and I should say there were times that I did get overwhelmed. Mm -hmm. um, and some of that is uh, overwork and you know, I wanted, I wanted to finish my book and <laughs> I, I got to a point with certain poems where I was like, you will be done like this weekend. And those were the times when it got overwhelming and when I burned out. And so I think it's really important to take breaks and to not rush. Um, it's, I just, you know, like I see a lot of writers really like pushing themselves so hard and that is, that is great. I mean, it's great to be ambitious and it's great to want to finish projects, but like your health and your happiness is probably more important um, than finishing that project this year. So, um, so I, you know, I did that a couple of times and then I stopped doing that <laughs> to myself. Um, so that's one thing. And then the other thing I would say is in these poems, a, a lot of them are kind of um, playful. Yes. And <clears throat> I think that that kind of play made them interesting to me on a different level than than just like, am I getting my story out there? Am I because there were poems in the book previously that I think were more about like my righteous feelings of rightness okay. and other people's wrongness. And those poems didn't work that well. And I ended up pulling them out. Um, mm -hmm. but I think the poems that ended up in the book, I like, they, they actually, they actually make me happy, even though mm -hmm. many of them are about sad things. Um, and I would say that one, I played with form. Okay. Um, a lot <clears throat> of the poems in the book use white space. Mm -hmm. And I like to think of those poems as similar to like how a painter works, you know, like. I'm always jealous of painters because I feel like they have their subject and their subject might be difficult, but they just like spend all day playing with color. And like, that just seems so fun. You know, mm -hmm. um, like mm -hmm. I have a friend who's a visual artist and she can talk on the phone with me while she's working. And I'm always like, <laughs> well, like that's so nice for you. Like I can't <laughs> talk on the phone when I'm working on the phone, you know, but in terms of the white space, like there is this feeling that I had when I was writing those poems that use that space of just of kind of like arranging something, mm -hmm. like arranging an object. Mm. Um, the poems are also really visual. Um, 
So there is this, um, I'm a very visual person. Like I have really vivid dreams and I, I just like think in images a lot mm-hmm. of the time. So I'm very attached to some of the images in the, mm-hmm. in the book. And then um, I have some places where I sort of invented forms. I mean, they're not forms that are really going to live outside of this book, I think, even though I keep sort of pushing. There's one that I keep pushing. <laughs> hey, <laughs> everyone. Yeah. Um, I'm somebody, sorry. Somebody, no, no, that's okay. No, at a reading once, I was like, by the way, this poem is in a form that I invented. If you want to write a poem using the same form. And somebody in the audience asked me, well, what's the name of the form? Oh, and I was like, that's awesome. I don't know. Write a poem and then maybe we can name it. Like, <laughs> I, um, so I did that a lot. And, and I, I just like, I made little challenges for myself. And then the other thing about these poems is that most of them live in a, a kind of dream world. Yes. Um, like, you know, the, there, so there's this poem, My Aunt, the Artist, the Liar, that's about, um, <laughs> it's about this, this girl going to visit her aunt somewhere. I imagine it's somewhere like in upstate New York, uh, in some rambling kind of property. And the aunt is a is a visual artist and they start finding evidence of a murder like around this um, estate and the aunt um, does something illegal and and hides the evidence. That's not real. Like that didn't happen in my life. Um, But definitely like my relative, like my aunts and uncles went into creating that character. Mm. So there's really like a lot of joy in creating things like that. So taking pieces of those experiences and kind of taking them apart probably helps in the process. And then in the processing of traumas, whether, you know, acknowledged or not, but then in getting them out there in this other creative way, the blank spaces also, I find in reading, help guide me as a reader the way they did you as a writer. Mm. Um, Do you want to read that one for us? The, the, my yeah. the artist the liar sure and this poem I should say this poem started out I challenged myself by saying I'm gonna I'm gonna end every line with the word teeth earth mouth or truth cool and um that's that's how the poem used to be and um then a couple people advised me that it was like a little too much teeth <laughs> earth, mouth, truth so <laughs> it, got, it got revised out of the poem a little bit but that's that was part of the gen- the generative process of it My aunt, the artist, the liar. On the path behind the house, we found the teeth, but no sign of the corresponding jaw. Whatever had been forced down to earth had been knocked or dragged elsewhere. My aunt rattled the teeth in her cupped palm. Sunlight dropped a dryness in my mouth. She was not the kind to tell the truth. A woman, she said. The teeth were small, like from a woman's mouth, and she knelt, pulled down to earth. Her fingers nosed the dirt for further proof. My aunt's little rented piece of earth, a house to make her crazy paintings in. They weren't animal teeth. I ran my tongue along the blank spots in my mouth. She'd try them in her own mouth, at parties, She told me later, cradling my jaw, little one, we rent ourselves from earth. Mm. Mm. So visceral. I feel like the teeth thing is just, it's such a thing for human beings, you know, like the, the dream where your teeth fall out, like something about our teeth is like our vulnerability, you know? And so it's so interesting to hear teeth handled so like roughly it's like kind of like crawls under your skin in a way that only like teeth can make happen (laughs) well and really interestingly on this theme you know I work with a lot of um paleobiologists and we can see trauma in milk teeth or in Mm. juvenile teeth from that was from the mother so we can see stressors from the mother in, a, in their offspring's teeth, um, which is just wow. wild, right? That is so crazy. <laughs> yeah, so 
Yes. Sorry. Amazing. That's my yeah, it's such a beautiful for you today. <laughs> I want to read an essay about that. Yeah. Um totally. Well that I love that one, Megan. Um thank you. I had another question about this and um it's, it gets more, I think, into the editing process. Some of, and, and you mentioned this a little bit, some of the the pieces you had started many years ago um, that made it into this book, some of them didn't make it, some of them became very, very different in the process. Um, how was that in terms of revisiting some of these things you had maybe put away or hadn't thought about in a while? Um, and did your experience of them change in the, the rewriting or the editing? Um, so I love editing. Um, it's most of the writing process for me is editing. Mm -hmm. Um, I, I think like, I always think of it as like clay, like you, if you're a sculptor, you get your Mm -hmm. clay and you get to shape it. And if you're a writer, you have to like make your own clay. Right. Mm -hmm. So, so that's your first draft. Mm -hmm. Um, kind of like what Rachel was talking about earlier about like the part where you're getting out all your feelings and you're, you know, you're not, you're just like in it. Um, so I edit a lot, maybe too much. Um, but in terms of the experience of going back over the poems, I think that they're, you know, publishing a book of poetry takes a really long time. Mm -hmm. It takes a lot longer than it used to. And if you look, I mean, if, if you look at the quality of um, the first books of writers from, you know, the previous generation, you can see there's a difference in quality, mm-hmm. <clears throat> excuse me, between first books. So if you look at like Galway Cannell's first book or, um, um, sorry, oh, Carolyn Forche's yeah. first mm-hmm. book, they're like, they're good, you know, but it's like their second book. Is amazing. Yeah. Right? <laughs> God, this is so true. Yeah. Um, but nowadays, what we're able to publish is more the second book, um, or it's a highly, highly edited first book. Mm-hmm. So um, I would say I, I, I think there was a, a bit of a feeling of like, oof, this is a little bit of a slog, you know, when I got to um, 2016 and you know, I had started sending out the book in 2012 and um, I had a, a poet friend that looked at it and, and made a lot of suggestions. And I was like, okay, <laughs> it's just, it's just oh, like, here we go. Like, um, but the poems are better than they were. And, and I think sometimes um, you can really, there can, it can feel really like a spark that's getting you back to that original feeling of creation that's in the editing process. If you can, mm-hmm. You know, if you can gear yourself up for it and if you can sort of not um, let your feelings get in the way. So, you know, you might have a feeling of why should I have to work on this anymore? Like, I liked this how it was. And and this <laughs> sort of like I not- relate to this so much, Megan, just because I've been working on my memoir for 10 years and I finally like finished a draft. And I just know that I have like three more years of editing ahead of me, regardless of how much work I've like put into it already. And it's yeah. So I'm just feeling everything you're saying. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I can, I'm trying to finish a novel right now. And sometimes I'm sitting, I'm writing, I'm on the third draft. And I'm just like, I'm gonna have to change all of this. <laughs> <laughs> it's it can be tough, you know. And so I think I think it's gotta. It's not always easy, but it's got to be something that makes you at least a little happy or or there are moments in it where you're like, Yes, I'm. I'm getting to that. Um, that feeling of creating something is a really beautiful feeling. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And yeah, while you were talking, I was thinking, this is why you have to like love your own writing because yeah. if you were not in love with your own writing, like, what would you make you like put this much work into <laughs> it? Like, keep coming back to the same story, the same poem, and like fix that one word or that one little place where it just feels a little bit off. And I'm just gonna think about it for like a whole day. Is it going to be this word or this word? <laughs> yeah. No, I agree. I think there's something that happens in my brain when I'm in that that 
when I'm really in the process and I'm not in my, in my head and my like, Oh, why is this not done? Why, you know, yeah. when I'm not there, but I'm just working, I'm a hundred percent working. My brain feels so good. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, yeah. That so dopamine, <laughs> the flow that people talk about. Um, Megan, I think one of the things that you achieve in this throughout this book is um, something that I always admired about uh, Rachel, our mentor, um, Vijay Shashadre, and his work. Um, you get the really intimate, concrete imagery side by side with the broad strokes of like bigger world expansion. Um, and I'm thinking in particular, of one poem, What We Kept. Um, and I was hoping you could read that one for us before we let you go. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. <clears throat> what We Kept. We kept the war under our tongues, kept it in our hamstrings, in our bones. We kept the war in our cereal bowls, in our juice, kept it in our first love, standing in the porch light, waiting to be kissed. We kept it close, in the hems of our shirts, our face cream, kept it in our bad skin. We kept it in our driveways, sitting quiet in the yard, flying the Bronx River Parkway, 2 a.m., kept it in key rings smashed into tables, the imprints they left on our palms. We kept it door to door, moss green in hinges, kept it mean, under our fingernails, forgotten in our socks. Sometimes we stood at the edge of a blueberry field, birds lit by the last of the sun. But under our skin, the whir click of the war beginning. Hmm. Thank you. So good. Thank um, you. This has been amazing. Uh, <laughs> you all Courtney's fangirling. <laughs> Thank you so hear much. Megan read at our <laughs> next interloop event on July 20th um, and find out more about her book, The Animal at Your Side, on display uh, and for sale uh, with our local bookselling partner, The Potter's House. Find out more about Megan and our Authors Corner program on our website, theinnerlooplit.org slash Authors Corner. And keep a look out for her article forthcoming in the Washington Independent Review of Books. And in the month of July, if you order takeout from our industry partners, Potter's House, Pie Shop, Shaw's Tavern, and Reveler's Hour, you'll see Megan and her book featured in our Eat, Drink, Read program. Megan, thank you so much again for talking with us. Um, will you stick around for a little bit of fun? Yeah. <laughs> but... <laughs> In addition to liking trauma, I also like fun. Exactly. <laughs> Up next, we're going to move away from trauma a bit and play with another of today's themes. Stay tuned. Welcome back to the Interloop Radio. Okay, we turn now to the animals at their sides. <laughs> uh, <laughs> just like Harry Potter characters, authors <laughs> seem to need patronuses. Did I say that? Is that pronouncing that correctly? Like, I have no idea. Um, for those <laughs> right. of you, it's like spirit animals, essentially. Um, and I want you two to guess which animals accompanied and or inspired which of the following famous writers. Okay. okay. So wait, are we guessing who, like, what kind of pet they had? Some of them. There is like a couple different things. Okay. They're okay. all animal related. Okay. Okay. Hit it. Okay. Hit it. This one is for. I'm gonna go. This one, Megan. I'm sorry. This one's actually for Rachel because she should guess it. But, um, which 20th <laughs> century writer claims that listening to the rhythm of her poodle named Baskets water drinking? Helped her see the difference between sentences and paragraphs. <laughs> Rachel, I'll give you a hint. Rhythm 
And this is someone who you re- refer to a lot. <laughs> oh, Gertrude Stein. Yes. Ding, ding, ding. <laughs> yes. That makes so much sense. I know, right? <laughs> um, okay. Megan, this one's for you. Okay. In Kafka's Metamorphoses, the protagonist, Gregor Samsa, awakes to find that he has become what? A, a dog. B, a giant insect, or C, an owl? B, a giant insect. That was too yes. easy. Okay. I know. <laughs> <laughs> you gave me a hard one. Okay. <laughs> okay, okay. Oh um, but he never defines the actual insect, which is a whole like other Kafka. I that know. I feel do. like I always assumed it was a cockroach. Am well, I the only one? Not- I thought it was no, a dung that's beetle. like a, a, a cockroach. Oh, a, a dung common, beetle. Du- yeah, like there are a couple that are popular. Anyway, mm-hmm. all right. I'm going to give this one to Megan actually because of her ecological, environmental <laughs> stuff. Um, was Rachel Carson a dog person or a cat person? <laughs> um, well, I have a 50% chance of getting it right. right. <laughs> um, I'm going to say dog person because cats kill a lot of birds. <laughs> that's, a, that's actually a really good guess, but she was, in fact, a cat person. Oh. Her, her beloved was Moppet. Oh, Moppet. Moppet. You have to oh. say it in a British accent. Moppet. Moppet. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah. Okay. Uh, Rach, this one's yeah. for you. What kind of birds did Flannery O'Connor famously keep? A, peacocks, B, parakeets, or C, peach-faced lovebirds? Well, I have to say peach-faced lovebirds just because that sounds so cool and I don't care if it's true. <laughs> I know, they're awesome, but no, it was peacocks, actually. She had, Whoa, really? Yes, she had many birds in her menagerie, but um, over a hundred like peacocks or something. Damn. Wow, right? Wow. Um, okay, last one. Megan, this one's for you. What was the name of Orwell's pet goat who inspired Animal Farm's nanny goat character? Aww. Okay. That's A, cute. Buttercup. <laughs> B, Scheherazade. Or C, Muriel. <laughs> Did you come up with Scheherazade? <laughs> like Arabian Nights, you know? Oh, you know. Oh, oh. <laughs> um, <So> yes. <laughs> I'm going to go with Muriel. Yeah! Ding, ding, ding. Oh, nice. <laughs> Good work. Well, um, thanks to all We each got one, Megan. <laughs> My Sondra is here. Um, and Megan, thank you again for joining us. Thank you so much. It was yeah. so fun. Awesome. Was such a pleasure. <laughs> that is our show. We will be back every other Monday. Did you know that the Inner Loop has lots of programming for writers in the DC area? <laughs> so much. <laughs> we do readings, retreats, workshops, a summer residency, and more. To read all about it, visit us at, once again, theinnerlooplit.org, where you can also donate to support us and local literature. Follow us on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter at The Inner Loop Lit. Today's episode was produced by me, Courtney Sexton. Our theme music is by Andrew Logan, and our technical advisor is James Skinner. Thanks again to Megan Albert for doing this on the show. And if you enjoyed today's episode, shout it from the rooftops. Or, better yet, leave us a review. Such as, I didn't even know I liked poetry. Thanks, Till Radio. (laughs) (laughs) Or... You can drink alone, or you can drink while listening to Courtney and Rachel talk about animals. (laughs) Don't forget to subscribe. Subscribe. Subscribe so you never miss an episode. Happy writing. Right on.